as you know, we're at a time of growth, of change, believing God that he grows and helps us to grow as a church. And I thought, well, let's look for an example in the Word, and we find a really good one in the book of Acts. We want to spend some time, probably the next couple weeks, going through the book of Acts, chapter after chapter, seeing how the early church began, how it grew, how the leadership was set up, um, things that God did, maybe some mistakes and some things they learned. Let's open our Bibles together to Acts chapter 2. Before we start reading that, um, I just want to remind you that at the time, at that time when the, the early church began, Jesus had gone to heaven. There was no church. There was only the Jewish people. Uh, there were some scattered believers. Some people been healed or their lives changed by Jesus, but no one really knew how to go forward. What they were supposed to do, and Jesus told them, wait, wait, just wait there. I'm going to do something. So let's see what happened, how Jesus decided to start the church. Let's start in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. When, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered, because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and marveled and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? And then they listed a whole bunch of languages that they were speaking in tongues. Now remember, these were people from an area where they were not well-educated, they were not learning foreign languages, and yet they were speaking all kinds of foreign languages, things they had never heard before, because the Holy Spirit came on them. And something else I want to notice here, when the Holy Spirit came, he did not come quietly. He did not tiptoe in the door and say, shh, I'm here. He came with a crash, a violent rushing wind. Everybody in town knew he was there, and it was good so. He wanted their attention. Otherwise, the people would not have come running out in the streets. It was 9 o'clock in the morning. Who comes running outside their door in the morning to say, Oh boy, what's happening out here when nothing's happening? Something happened. There was a loud sound, a loud sound. And they came to see what in the world is going on. Imagine there was a giant boom outside your door. And you're drinking your coffee and you go, Whoa. You open the door and see what in the world happened out there. Well, that's what those people did. Except they ran out and they see what is happening. And when they got outside, they found, saw these people standing there speaking in their own languages. There were a lot of foreigners in that town. But suddenly, these people were speaking words they understood. And what was it they were saying? Verse 11. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongue speaking of the mighty deeds of God. They weren't saying just anything. They were talking about the mighty deeds of God. And they were all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying that they're full of sweet wine. You notice how every time God does something, people try to come up with an excuse. Oh, that can't be real. Oh, that guy wasn't really sick. Oh, that didn't really change. Oh, that didn't really... Because people, some people will always refuse to believe. But most of them knew something major had just happened. Now, here's the important thing. The Holy Spirit came. He gave them that anointing. But Peter and the apostles, they did something with it. They didn't miss that opportunity. We're not going to read all of this. We'll just pick out some verses. But when the people started saying the full of sweet wine, Peter stood up and said, they're not drunk. Let me just paraphrase a little bit here. They're not drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh -uh. What you're seeing right now is what was said through the prophet Joel. And then he quoted Joel. I will pour out of my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. 
In those days I will pour out of my spirit. He quoted Joel to let the people know. These were people who knew the prophet Joel. That this was something that God had preordained. This was something that God wanted. But he didn't stop there to say this is what that's all about. He went right into telling them about Jesus. He told them about Jesus. Remember? He was here. Did signs and wonders. Did miracles. You know. And yet... You nailed him to a cross. You notice how the first couple messages, they always pointed the finger back. You point, nailed him to the cross. Now the people standing in the crowd didn't literally do that. But some of them were there shouting, crucify, crucify. It hadn't been that long. Some of them had been there. And he wanted them to recognize, you know, nobody will have a change in their life until you recognize your need for change. Until you are convicted of your own sin and your own guilt, you have no reason to turn to you. He pointed them back to that. You are there. And he told them about Jesus and how God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand. And how he had, he had sent the Holy Spirit to them. But let's look here at verse 36. He made something very plain to them. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. People, you're in trouble. Now he's Lord. You crucified him. And God made him Lord. What are you going to do about it? In other words, what did the people do? Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There was only one way for these people. They needed to repent. And they needed to be baptized. Baptism was a sign of the change going from sin to a life, to new life in Christ. They needed to do that, repent and be baptized. They took that seriously. Him, Peter, and the other apostles, they told them, you need to do this, be saved. 3,000 people that day accepted him. They believed, they were baptized. 3,000 people, the church was born. 3,000 new babes in Christ. What did they do with that newborn church? Let's look at verse 42. And they were continually devoting themselves to, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Stop a second. What did you do with newborn babes in Christ? You teach them. Number one thing, teach them. Teach them the word. But the second thing they did was fellowship. People are not supposed to be alone. If somebody walks in off the streets and gives their heart to Jesus, but they have no idea how to live as a Christian, you do not turn them loose. You find out their name where they're at, maybe how you can contact them, and you talk to them, you encourage them. You say, hey, you know what, brother, let's, um, let's read the Bible together. I got some literature to help you out. You make sure they're doing okay. They fellowshiped. They spent time together, and they didn't only fellowship. It says the breaking of bread. Breaking of bread was twofold there. That wasn't just eating meals, though they did eat meals together, but it was also taking communion. For them, they took communion Often. And communion was there to remind him of what Jesus had done. He who died for you. He who bore your sin and carried your sickness. To make the strength in their faith. And they spent time praying. I don't think the fact that signs and wonders were taking place to the apostles was an accident. The praying, I'm sure, helped. Because now they were not alone. It wasn't 12 apostles. Wasn't 120 people. The church was praying, God, do it for them. My neighbor over there, he needs us too. My daughter, my son, my uncle. They were praying. And the power of God was there. And he was, miracles and signs were going forth. Look at verse 47. The people were praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Every day, more people. 
So now they're past 3,000 already. That's the very first message for the church. But then in chapter 3 came another message very similar to that. Peter and John decided to go to church. And on their way to church, I'll just tell this one. On their way to church, they ran into a lame man. A guy who had never walked his entire life. I believe he was, um, I think he was, he was not a young man at all. And they spoke in the name of Jesus, walk, and, and the healing power of God came on him and he rose up and he started walking and leaping and praising God and making a scene and the people went, whoa, what is this? That lame man has been outside the temple for decades. We know who he is. And the people were excited. And they come running into the church to see what's going on, what's going on. Now they got a crowd again. Second time. There's a crowd. There's a miracle. God was going to do something again. Peter took advantage of it a second time. Told him about Jesus. Told him they needed to come to him and repent. But this time while he was preaching, the priests and the Sadducees got involved. They didn't like it. Now we're in chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 2, he said they were being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They did not like them talking about Jesus being raised from the dead. Why? Of course, we know without his resurrection from the dead, there would be no salvation. He'd just been another man who lived and died. But he wasn't another man who lived and died. He rose again, became Lord. And when he is... They told about that. This was Peter and John now. They did not want them to say it. So they put him in jail. Kept him there all night. And the next day they pulled him in. But here's an interesting thing. Verse 4 of Acts 4. says, But many of those who had heard the message believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. 2,000 more men. Peter didn't even finish his message. The Holy Spirit was working. Without the opportunity to pray for him and baptize him and all that stuff, God did it anyways. He just drew the people in. So anyways, they brought Peter and John before the, the temple rulers, Ananias, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and all those people in front of the, probably the Sanhedrin, and they started saying, verse 7, when they placed him in the center, they began to inquire, By what power or in what name have you done this? Now, what were they trying to do? They wanted to intimidate him. Who gives you a right to stand up in the temple and teach when you're not even a high priest and you're not even from our school? You know, intimidation. But God does not accept intimidation. Peter didn't. Jesus didn't either. They tried to back him in a corner and he backed them in a the corner. They said, by what name are you doing this? And Peter said, filled with the Holy Spirit. That's verse 8 now. He said to him, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the very cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Those are pretty bold words for men who were not educated, not of the elite. Speaking up to those who were the elite, who had the authority in the nation. But they had confidence in God. And they were speaking the truth. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. It was right. They were telling him the truth. They said, if we're on trial because we healed somebody, it was Jesus who did it. It wasn't us. And when they saw these men, they thought, how in the world can these, we would say, country bumpkins, a fisherman, and a, how can they have so much confidence in front of us, the mighty? And they realized, ah, uh, they've been with Jesus. You know, when you're with Jesus enough, that confidence comes. It never depends on us, guys. It's not how great we are. 
It's not how educated we are. It's not how powerful. It's not what kind of a name you have. Who cares what your name is? We have the name above all names. He's on our side. The Holy Spirit lives inside us. We have a right to speak in his name. And that's exactly what they were doing there. The council was afraid to do anything with them. So they, they said, well, a miracle did happen. This guy's healed. We can't really punish him for that. So let's just threaten him. So they threatened him. Don't speak again in that name of Jesus. We don't want you teaching about that anymore. Thinking they could intimidate them, you know, with their stern voice. But Peter and John answered, verse 19, and said to him, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. Did they just say no to the high priest? Kind of a dangerous thing. Yes, they did. Why did they say no to him? They said, we have to obey God, right? Now they were threatened, and they did take the threat seriously. They went home, to found the other, their other companions, probably got all the other apostles together and uh, those who followers that they had, and they told them about the threats. They said, you better stop. You better stop teaching in that name. You better stop spreading it all over. So they told them, that's what they said to us, and then they prayed. Oh, and their prayer was great. First, they started off putting everything in perspective. Lord, it's you who made the heavens. You're God. These guys aren't God. You know, when you feel threatened, that's the time when we need to look up the most. When people around are saying, I'm so powerful and you're going to suffer because of me. They say, oh, no, God's above you. But they didn't stop there. They quoted the word. And they they brought the problem to him. Lord, these people who killed you, they're threatening us now. And look at what they asked for. Verse 29. I like that. said, And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bond servants may speak your word with all confidence. While you do, while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place to the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed, but the place where they gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. You notice they didn't pray, God, make them stop. God, we don't want to suffer. We don't want to be threatened. We don't want anything bad to happen to us. They were past that. They were just willing to do what, what had to be done. And they said, Lord, make us bold. And if we, as you enable us to speak with confidence, we're asking you to confirm the word with signs and wonders. You heal. You do the miracles. We're just going to speak your name. We're going to say what you tell us to say. And we're going to do what you tell us to do. God gave them boldness. And if you look in the chapters that come after this, these people were very, very bold. Very, very bold. Then we get down to chapter 5. And something interesting happened here that you would not expect. Actually, this chapter begins with judgment. Acts 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. And you might say, why is that a problem? Well, let's back up to chapter 4, verse 34. They were trying to copy what some other people had done. Acts 4.34 For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Several people had done this already. Barnabas, who we, who we hear more about later. Barnabas did this. He sold land and gave it to them. And probably these people got praise for it or people, you know, treated him with respect. Or I don't know what was going on, but obviously it was something that Ananias and Sapphira wanted to. They wanted to be treated with respect. They wanted people to say, wow, you guys did a great job or whatever. But on the other hand, they didn't really want to give the price of that land. They wanted to keep some of it. So they thought, we'll just tell them 
we'll just say it costs so much. And that's what we got. And we'll just keep some for ourselves. Do you see why that was a problem here? Let's look at Acts 5, verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it you've conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all, came upon all who heard of it. What was the problem here? Peter said, look, it was your land. You didn't have to sell it. And after you sold it, you didn't have to give it all. The problem was the lie. Do you know how much God hates lying? God is very, very severe with liars. If you read the book of Revelation, you'll see that very clearly. He mentions liars as people going in the pit of hell because he hates lies. He wants us to be truthful. What if Ananias had said, let's say in, in modern terms, Peter, I sold this house for $100,000 and I want to give the church 50000 I want to keep some back for my wife and me. What if he'd just been honest and said that? No problem. They'd have said, great. We're glad that you're helping us, brother. That's great that you, you, know, you give something to help. But he didn't want that. He wanted credit for doing a totally generous thing. I really gave everything I had, like the other people had. Other people had really done it. But he wanted the credit that others deserved. God did not like lying. So much that this man, he died on the spot. That's pretty severe. And then... When we get go waiting after a couple hours later, his wife came in, didn't know what happened. So verse 8, Peter asked her, Peter responded to her, tell me whether you sold the land for such and such a price. And she said, yes, that was the price. And Peter said to her, why is it you've agreed together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they shall carry you out as well. And she fell immediately at his feet and breathed the last. Those two people dropped dead within a matter of four hours. That's horrific. I've not heard of people dropping dead in church for lying. I don't know. If people started dropping dead in church for lying today, I'd be pretty nervous. <laughs> Let's look at verse 11. And great fear came upon the whole church. I bet it did. And upon all who heard of these things. And at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico, but none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. The fear of God was on the church and on anybody who heard about it. They thought, we don't mess with these people. We're not touching these people. They got something we don't have. And yet, they respected them. But in spite of that, it wasn't the kind of fear where they were running from God. It's where God drew them back and said, look, you will respect me. You will respect me. And they did. They learned. Verse 14. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women, were constantly added to their number. See, it didn't stop people from getting saved. To such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets. So that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. People were getting saved constantly. And people thought, the whole thing with Peter's shadow, you notice this is the only time it's mentioned. It's not promised. Jesus did not promise that you shall walk by people and your shadow will heal them. That's not a promise. But in this one given situation, I think honestly, this is my opinion, the apostles were probably getting a bit overwhelmed. There were so many people getting saved and so many people demanding attention. I need healing now and my uncle and my brother and my cat and my dog and whatever. You know, everybody they could think of bringing, bringing them. And not only from Jerusalem, the next verse says, all the vicinity of Jerusalem, they were coming together. Verse 16, bringing people that were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits and they were all being healed. They were all being healed. I'm sure they were spending a lot of time praying with these people but there was a point where they needed a break and so God said I'm going to do this thing Peter you walk down the street people left and right 
that your shadow touches, they'll be healed. Now, I imagine those people laying in the cot were believing. They were using their faith for it. If this guy just walks by, if his shadow just comes on me. You know, like the woman with the issue of blood? Coming in faith. I'm going to get healed today. This man's going to walk by and I'm going to get healed. God allowed that to happen, I think, to help them out at that time. But here comes jealousy's ugly head again. Jealousy is a dangerous thing. Remember right before Jesus was crucified, the Pharisees standing and talking together. You see, we're not doing any good. They only listened to him. They said that and then started the whole downhill thing. Well, verse 17 but the high priest rose up along with his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy, and they laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. But an angel of the Lord during the night opened the gates of the prison, and taking them out, he said, Go your way, stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. And upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. Skipping down to the end of that verse, um, the council got together, all the big shots. They were going to try these men, and they sent orders to the prison, bring them out of prison. But when the officers went, guess what they didn't find? The apostles. Empty jail. They said, the guards are standing in front of the door, but then nobody inside. Now they didn't know what to do. Don't you think, if you're spiritually sensitive at all, you would take a warning at this thing? Wait a minute, wait a minute. We locked them all up last night. I know we did. I saw them turn the key, and this morning they disappeared, and the guards don't even know. Um, do you not think God is trying to get their attention to say, calm your jealousy, guys. This is my, my doing. Well, somebody went and saw them, saw them teaching in the temple, as God had told them to do, and said, the men you put in prison are standing in the temple teaching. So the guards went again and very carefully brought them back without violence because they thought, if we touch these people now, they're going to kill us. So they probably just went and said, um, uh, gentlemen, would you uh, come with us, please? You know, And they had to use their good manners to save their own lives. So they went with them back to the council, and the council said, Verse 28, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and behold, you filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Stopping just a moment, they filled Jerusalem already. Hadn't been that long. You filled Jerusalem with this teaching? That's pretty good, actually. Verse 29, but Peter and the apostles answered and said, we must obey God rather than men. They refused to back down. They were doing, it was working. The gospel was spreading, the church was growing, miracles were happening, but this man's jealousy wasn't going to let him go. He said, we have to obey God. We can't stop. We have to say it. These men got so mad, they wanted to kill them all. Can you imagine if that had happened? They wanted to kill all the apostles in one shot before the church even left Israel. But God, verse 34, a certain Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law respected by the people, stood up in the council, gave orders, put him outside for a short time, and he said to him, men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. Somebody was thinking, somebody was thinking, this is not normal. This is not normal. We better be careful here. And then he gave two examples of people who'd rose up and said they, they were somebody and got a group following them and then ended up dying. And, and that group's falling apart. And so down to verse 38, he says, And so in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or action should be of men, it'll be overthrown. But if it is of God... You will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. This man had the fear of God on him. He told him, stop. Basically, stop with your silly jealousy. Stop it. 
if this is if this is something they're just making up, it's gonna fall apart. The other things fell apart. This one will fall apart. But if this is God, do you want to be caught fighting God? This was a man who studied the law. He knew that was not a good idea, and so they did. They thought, well, we can't just turn them loose, and so they whipped them all. All the apostles whipped them, turned them loose, and they went out rejoicing. Yeah, we suffered shame for him. Instead of crying over it, they were glad, and they kept right on teaching and preaching. There was no stopping them. Boldness. Boldness in their hearts. Six and seven we'll put together. We're going to summarize these. Um, and that'll, that's where we'll stop today, after six and seven. But we're getting a little bit of a picture how things were going on. There were a lot of signs and wonders happening, but there was a lot of prayer. And there was a price. They had to stand strong. They had to speak out. They had to be bold. And God anointed them and enabled them. Now in chapter 6, it says... Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. There were different people in that town. Remember we saw in uh, chapter 2, all those different people speaking different languages? Some of those people were also being born again. And some of those widows, they were feeding the widows because to lose your husband in that day was basically a death sentence for a woman. She had no support, no one to look out for. If you don't have children, if you don't have a son old enough to take care of you, you have no source of income. And you have no say. And so they were doing that as a good deed, as a good thing that the church should do, feeding the widows. But the native Hebrews were kind of neglecting those who spoke Greek those that weren't born there, there was some prejudice, some disparity going on, and it wasn't right. It was right for them to complain. And now, how did the apostles going to fix this? You start having trouble in the ranks. They had an idea from God, I believe. They said, look, we can't spend our time feeding everybody. That's not what God called us to do. And you know, it would be easy for a minister to spend all their time running around, um, putting out fire, so to speak. Doing every little thing, but that was not the call of God on their lives. He said, you choose seven men, there are three qualifications. A good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and a wisdom. And we'll put them in charge of this task. But we are going to focus on prayer and ministry of the word. Well, that's what they were supposed to do. Prayer, teaching the word. That was their job. But these men, they had to have a good reputation. Why is that? You don't put somebody into an office in the church who does not have a good reputation. And people look at him and say, oh, I know him. That guy cheated me last year or whatever. Hmm, it's not a good witness. Full of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. They need to have the Holy Spirit. They need to have the love and the patience of him. Full of wisdom. Got to know how to deal with people. Those kind of people. So they chose seven men. One of them was named Stephen. Verse 6, And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying they laid their hands on them. They solved the problem. These men's job was to make sure the feeding went well, and they obviously took care of it because the problem stopped. Look at verse 7. And the word of God kept on spreading. And the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. The word of God kept spreading. They could not stop it. The disciples increased. A great many priests. Don't you imagine some of the men sitting in the Sanhedrin when the, when the apostles disappeared were thinking. Some of the priests who'd heard Jesus were probably thinking eventually. A whole lot of them came to faith because men who were honest, men who had heard the word of God and taught, were taught in it, had to recognize who Jesus was. It was very, very clear, clear from the scriptures. A great many priests becoming obedient to the faith. Now, let's start with Stephen's story. Verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. And yet they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. 
Then they secretly induced men to say, We've heard him speak blasphemies, blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and came on him and drug him away and brought him before the council. And then they paid some people to lie. Stephen, one of the deacons, this is not an apostle now. This was one of the men chosen to wait on tables. And yet the Holy Spirit was on him heavily. He was anointed. He was doing great signs and wonders. I wonder what was happening through his ministry. Great signs and wonders were happening through him. Such a heavy anointing on him when they tried to argue. People came to pick fights. And, he, and they just couldn't win over him because the Holy Spirit told him what to say. Gave him wisdom to know what to do. And they just made him mad. Some people only want to fight. They don't really want answers. They just want to pick. Want to pick. But these men were very malicious. They weren't satisfied to pick a fight. They thought, we can't win. We'll pay somebody to say that he broke the law. And breaking the blasphemy against Moses was breaking the law in those days. So that's what they said. He blasphemed. He spoke against Moses and against God. Got them all stirred up. And they drug him in, arrested him. There he is standing in front of the council. And so they said, Stephen, you can defend yourself. And so he preached. Oh, he preached a fiery message. It was a good one. He didn't get to finish it. But he was trying hard to show them that they needed to come to repentance. That the way they're living was not right. Preached them a long message clear up to Acts 7, 53. But instead of accepting the message and repenting like they did on the day of Pentecost, these guys just got mad. Verse 54, Acts 7 says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. Can you imagine being so mad you start grinding your teeth? I can't imagine. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Where they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and they rushed upon him with one impulse. And when they'd driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. These people were so mad that he told them the truth. Instead of accepting the truth and repenting like so many thousands had already, they chose, now kill the messenger. Let's just kill the messenger. That'll take care of it. Let's just don't listen to what he says and let's just get rid of him. If he dies, he can't talk anymore. Do you know that does not work well? Because the truth of God's word remained. Except they'd added guilt to themselves. I like the fact that he saw God allowed him to see into heaven. And Jesus was standing at the right hand of God. Standing. He was not sitting. It says, the Bible tells us Jesus sits at the right hand of God. But when he knew they're going to kill Stephen now, he stood up. Imagine how mad the king of kings must have been. To watch one of his anointed get murdered. But he let him see it. What a comfort. Hey, I know and I care. I'm watching. And this is not okay. So they stoned Stephen. And as he was being hit, he said, Lord, receive my spirit. A good prayer. And then he prayed something really, really important. Verse 60. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice. Lord, do not hold this sin against him. And having said this, he fell asleep, which my footnote says he died. The last thing he said with his mouth was, don't hold this against him, God. Don't hold it against him. That mercy that we all should have. These people that are killing me right now, Lord, would you please give them an opportunity to be born again? And God heard that prayer. Because Saul, who was holding the robes of the men who were killing Stephen, became the Apostle Paul. But when we get to his story, we'll also see that Jesus confronted him over that day. And he said, why are you persecuting me? Because Jesus took it personally. Why? 
I'll answer for that one. He had to answer for that one. He needed the mercy of God and he knew it then. Thank God he repented. Not like these others who refused to repent. That's how the church began. We're going to go on and look at that some more. Because if this is a turning point in the church. From this point on, persecution began and they started going out to different cities. Eventually to different countries. Jesus had told them go into all the world and preach the gospel. But they had been stuck in Jerusalem for several years now. And it was time. It was time to go out. What can we learn from these guys? The whole thing began with obedience. Let's go back to Acts. Acts chapter 1. The whole thing happened because they simply did what Jesus told them to do. Acts 1 verse 4 and 5. And gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, You heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus told them, he commanded them, don't leave. Wait. The Holy Spirit's coming. You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Of course, they didn't know what that meant. But they knew one thing. If Jesus said, stay right here and don't move until it happens. They obeyed. It's the same for us. If we'll just do what he says. If we'll just obey. He may not say that to you because, of course, the Holy Spirit's already here. He lives inside of us now. But he might say something else. Do this thing. Go here. Don't do this thing. Wait. Whatever he says, let's pay close attention. And then let's just do like they did. Go step by step. Step by step. None of them knew what was coming when that happened. But as they obeyed God, the whole world was changed. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the privilege of following you. For the privilege of being part of your church, the body of Christ. It is not just a small group. It is many, many, many thousands and even millions of Christians around the world now in your body. People who love you and follow you. We thank you for the privilege of being part of that. We thank you for the privilege of knowing you. Father, help us to be sensitive to your voice. Quick to hear. Quick to obey. Quick to follow you, whatever steps you give us to take. And we'll give you all the honor and all the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen.